last time. We had talked about how you can use the exception class or you can create your own exception classes. Um, so in this example, which we'll look at in a minute here, I have a driver's permit class. Um, and I'm actually, I've actually created custom exception classes for each of the potential problems that are, have occurred. I've identified the problems that could uh, occur in this. Uh, the problems that I uh, identified that could occur would be the age too low exception. Again, I, I ignored the age too high issue and said that wasn't an issue. And that there was an issue with the driver's permit score. All right. And I did that by creating sort of a structure of exceptions. So if we were to look at the exception classes I created, they would look something like this. I have at the root a driver's permit exception. Driver permit exception, which is a subclass of Java's own exception class. I have inheriting from that a driver's permit age exception and a, a driver's permit too low exception. I also have inheriting from that a driver's permit score exception. Now, this might be overkill, okay? And, but I did want to demonstrate, like, first of all, how you would create your own exceptions and talk a little bit about why you would create your own exceptions, all right? The way you create your own exceptions is like this. It's like any other class. My super class, I didn't want to do that. My super class, no, that's not the one. Extends exception. And I chain the one argument constructor to call the superclasses constructor. So it calls the exception class constructor. It's pretty straightforward. It's almost no code in here. All right. All my other ones, if I look at the age exception, pretty much does the same thing and extends its superclass. The only difference is, is this extends the driver's permit exception. The driver's permit age low exception <laughs> extends the driver's permit age exception. And again, does the same thing, change to the constructor. And then finally, the driver's permit score exception is for a different class of exception, and it, 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 uh, it uh, extends the driver's permit exception, and the constructors are chained. So why do all this? There's like no code in here other than chaining con the constructors together. The reason you would do this is if you wanted to handle different kinds of exceptions different ways. All right, it's probably better to err on the side of overkill on the throwing exception side. Why do you think I say that? Why do I think it might be better to throw a lot of exceptions, a lot of different kinds of exceptions? What does that give us the chance to do? 
create less problems. Um, that's true. How would that allow us to create less problems? Yes. So we're right. Because we can deal with different problems in different ways. Uh, we can't easily do that if all of these were exceptions. So if all of these, in my driver's permit class, if I simply threw an exception, then my catch could only catch exceptions. And if there's different kinds of exceptions, it would be difficult to make my code differentiate and do one thing if it was one kind of exception, another thing if there was another kind of exception. So by throwing a very specific exception, we have the capability of handling that specific exception in a specific way. Because we can catch for that specific uh, um, exception. Here's the good news. We don't have to if we don't want to. We could still have the catch catch for all exceptions. All right? So our cat, if I'm throwing these exceptions, these different kinds of exceptions, I then have the capability to catch these different kinds of exceptions and do something different depending on which exception gets thrown. I can do that. But I also have the capability of saying, forget it. I'm just going to catch exceptions if I'm not going to particularly do anything different uh, for them. In addition, we can create attributes and methods on these other exceptions if we wanted to. For example, and I'll go and make this change uh, probably later on today, not right this minute, but I could add a score attribute to the driver's permit score exception. And then if we were logging it to a file, we could do things like we could log attributes about that exception, like who is administering the test, if we had that. What was, the, what was the incorrect score? Who was the student that got the incorrect score? We could put all those things in attributes right in the exception class. So if we were going to write a file that contains these exceptions to gather some information, we'd have all that information right there. We wouldn't have to go back and do research or whatever. We could put all these attributes as part of the exception. And then when we handle that exception, we could do something with those attributes. Again, this is a little hard to illustrate because all we're doing with these exceptions is just displaying a message. System out, print LN, hey, there was a problem. So we're not really handling them any different. But believe me, we could handle them all different kinds of ways. We could display a message in the GUI. We could output to a file. We could default values to a certain value. Like if they got less than zero points, we could give them a zero um, and then continue evaluating it. We could evaluate it really any way we wanted to. All right. So that's the advantage of uh, throwing a bunch of different kinds of, of, of exceptions. If we're only throwing exceptions, then that's all we can possibly catch. If we're throwing all of these exceptions, we can catch them to whatever level of detail we want. For example, assuming there was an age too high exception here, I could catch the age too high or the age too low, maybe do something different. Or I could just catch the fact that there's an age exception. Or I could just catch the fact that there was some exception with the driver's permit application. All right? So I could catch on whatever level I wanted to. Now, if you notice this, this says that this function is eligible in addition to these other things I state in the signature that it throws these exceptions. What happens if I don't have these in here, if I don't have the throws exceptions in here? Well, let's go and try and compile it. If I don't throw these, I get an error. Why do I get an error? Well, because remember, if you're throwing an exception, something has to catch it. All right? 
And this isn't an exception that's thrown by the framework. This is an exception that we're throwing. So this code If this code is throwing exceptions, then someone has to handle it. And if this code doesn't handle the exceptions, we have to pass it off to whoever called this function. All right? So if this guy doesn't handle it, we have to throw that exception back up to the next function, the function that called this function. And we can do that so on, and so on, and so on. We have to pass it up what's called the call stack. All right, we'll talk about call stacks in a minute here, because I think it's an important concept uh, to have. But the thing is, is this throws an exception, it better deal with it, or it better pass it on to whoever called it to deal with it. So since this doesn't have any catch statements to catch these exceptions, then We better throw those exceptions, and then it will compile clean. Now, if we had all those wrapped in a try catch, we wouldn't need to throw the exception. We would throw the exception and catch it in the same place, all right, in the same function. Questions about that? Yes? A throw exception says I have a problem that someone needs to deal with, all right? Now, the someone, in this case, could be the function that has the exception. So I could throw the exception and catch it in the same function. But if I don't handle it within that function, I have to throw it back up to the function that called me. And then it has to handle it, or it has to throw it up to the, to the function that, call, that uh, um, called it, or so on and so on. All right? When you have functions, calling other functions, you have what's called a stack. All right? A stack is a data structure where is the first in, no, yeah, la the last in is the first out. So in other words, if I have a function, let's say I have a bunch of functions. A, B, C, D, these are all functions. And let's say A calls B. The stack, the call stack, would put on it, when A called B, it would put A on the stack. That means when B finishes, the top one on the stack, the code goes back to. So it would go back to A. Now what if A called B, called C, called D, called E? Then A would be put on the stack first, then B, then C, then D. So when E finished, it would pop the item off the stack and go back to D to call it uh, and finish that. When D finished, it would pop the C off the stack and continue with that code on up the, on up the ladder. So if this guy throws an exception, if A calls B calls C calls D, and E throws an exception, guess what? One of these guys has to handle it. All right? One of these guys has to handle it, because someone has to handle an exception. All right? So if an exception is thrown in E, then Someone, E through E, D, C, B, and A, one of those has to handle it. And if it doesn't handle it, it has to throw it. Throwing it effectively is like uh, delegating it to the next guy. So, for example, if E threw an exception and E didn't handle it, it would throw it to D. And D could handle it or could not handle it. If D didn't handle it, it would throw it. Well, guess who would get it? Whoever called D. C would have to handle it. And so on up, up the line until you hit, till there was no more functions to be called. And if it hit the line where no more functions will be, were called and no one handled it, you would get a compile error. 
And that's exactly what we got a minute ago. I didn't have five functions. I had two functions. Function one called function two. And when I didn't say that it threw it, because function two didn't handle it and it didn't throw it, there was an exception it wasn't handled. Now, when I put the fact that it throws it in there, then function two can throw the exception, and function one is there to handle it. Because we have in our test class code to handle these exceptions. Now again, remember, you can catch to any level you want to. And you catch based on what you want to do if you find an error. You can create the uh, exception classes to give the option to either test very specifically for the error or test very generally. Um, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and add an attribute to one of these exceptions. I'm going to add an age to the driver's permit low age exception. And I'm going to put a constructor for an age argument. Now, there is no age in a regular exception, right? Exceptions don't know anything about ages, all right? There is a string for the exception message. But I'm going to put a argument for the age. And I'm going to set the integer of age, age equals arg age. And then I'm going to do a get age method. So when I throw the exception in the driver's permit class, I can say throw new exception age is too low to be a valid age, comma, our gauge. So I can create that exception object that contains not just a message, but a message in an age. The message gets passed up to the superclass. All right, and the age gets stored in an instance variable, in a property. I can then, when I'm handling that, I could catch for that low age exception and display the error message and do something out, do something else with the age. Maybe I write it to a file or something like that. But I have it as a property and I can do something with it. Now again, notice the only age I'm specifically trapping for is the age too low exception. What if one of these other ages, uh, exceptions rather, are thrown? Then the catch all, catch exception will handle it. All right? So again, you can catch it to whatever degree of detail works for your particular project. So let's go and look at this. And let me compile it. possible lossy conversion. Um, what does that mean? What's a lossy conversion? You can lose data. 
In this case, um, what's the data that I could lose and why is it? The reason is that um, R gauge is a, is a double and my property is an integer. So I can fix, so I could lose, I could lose some data. This is actually, yeah, this is an error. So I'm going to go in and um, I'm going to change this so that it accepts a double instead of an integer. That way we won't have that error. Okay, compiled cleanly. And again, we get the exception message, which is, lives with all exceptions, that says there's something wrong with the age. And then we're able to isolate the age. Now, in the first version of this, I included the age as part of that string. The problem with that is if I include it as part of the message, I can't really do anything to it separately. All right? By isolating it and making its own attribute for it, then I can handle things and do things separately with it. Questions on this? So what you have to do, and this assignment is broken in two parts, and I'll do my best to get part one graded as quick as possible. I know I've fallen behind a little bit uh, on grading. But your next assignment is to go and add exceptions to one of the assignments that we've done before. I think the last student example that you had. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at your code and figure out all the things that could produce goofy results. So part one of the assignment which is due Friday, is to look at Lab 5 and list the exceptions you'll test for. So what are some of the things that could go wrong with your tuition calculation that would not be catched by a compiler? Yes? Using the wrong data format. Can you be more specific? You probably would get a compile error with that. All right. But you're definitely on the wrong, you're definitely on the wrong track. <laughs> you're definitely on the right track if you supply bad data to one of your functions. Let's look at the pizza example. All right, let's look at one of the pizza examples. Let's look at this, let's just look at the pizza class. What are some bad values that we could give that wouldn't cause a compile error, but would cause some grief? Like let's say it would cause the calculation of the bake time to be wrong. Or the calculation of the cost to be wrong. Putting in the wrong string. Right? That wouldn't cause a compile error, right? We could set the size to Excel if we wanted to, right? The way it's written now. Because we didn't do any sort of validation. We just assumed that the data was going to be correct. And you remember at the time we created this, I said, for now we're going to assume that all the data is correct, but later on we're going to go and we're going to put some validation in it. All right? Well, now's the time that we're going to put validation in it. 
So what we could do is we could create on the set method for set size, we could throw an exception if the size wasn't one of the legal values, small, medium, or large. In fact, let's go and do that. Let's go, I, yeah, let's go, let me close out of all of these, because I think we're done with that example. Well, let's go and do that. I'm going to create, I'm going to say that this guy throws exception. Now, I could make a specific pizza exception if I wanted to. But I'm not going to in this case. All right? I already did an example where I created my own exception. So I'm not going to do this here. So I'm going to say if arg not equal s or arg going to do this. If arg.equals, forgot my own advice for a second there. If arg equals s or arg equals m or arg equals L, then everything's okay. And I can set the size equal to the argument. Otherwise, Row new exception, and I'll give a message. Size not correct on pizza. All right. So I'm giving this a string argument. The string could have what in it? It could have any character. Well, we know that for our application to work, it has to equal small, medium, or large. All right? So I check to see if it's equal to small or medium or large. And if it is, then I set the size equal to the argument. Otherwise, I throw a new exception. And again, I have to say throws exception on the set size because this isn't going to be the code that's going to handle it. All right? The code that's going to handle it is going to be whoever calls this. So I'm going to save this. And I'm going to go Right, so I'm in that folder, and I compile it. I get an error. It's in line 11. Line 11 is what? The constructor. I say this set size. Hmm. 
Why does this give me an error? This set size could throw an exception. Why does this constructor give me an error? Well, what happens when you call a function and can throw an exception? You might get back an exception, which means that either it had better handle it, or since it's throwing it, it's giving it back to you, so you better handle it. Now, do we want to handle this in the constructor? Probably not. I want to probably handle it in whoever calls a constructor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this guy throws exception. So how's this going to work? My test, my test class is going to call the constructor. If I give it some goofy value for size, the constructor calls the set size. The set size is going to look and see it's not one of the allowable sizes. It's going to throw an exception. It doesn't handle the exception. It just throws it. My constructor doesn't have any code to handle the exception either. So what does it do? It throws it. So the code to handle this exception better live in the um, Test, uh, the test class, the unit test class. Because all of these classes have delegated it, have passed the buck. All right? <clears throat> maybe, maybe they should have called throwing exception pass the buck on the exception. Because rather than doing something yourself, you're saying someone else is going to handle it. Whoever, um, this is up to whoever called me. So the exception first gets call, created in the set size method. The constructor calls the set size method, so it might have to deal with that exception. So it's going to go, go correspondingly and call the method, uh, or it's going, to, it's going to pass it on, and whoever called the constructor is going to have to deal with it. So let me go into the unit test for this. And I'm going to give this a goofy value, like maybe the full word small. And I'm going to wrap a try. Catch around it. And again, since I'm only throwing an exception, that's all I can catch. So I'm going to say catch. Exception E. And I'm going to output whatever the value of the exception is, whatever the value of the message is. I didn't save the pizza class because I changed the constructor to throw that exception. So now it compiles cleanly. Pizza Java 20. Oh, all these constructors could potentially throw that exception. So I have to put throws exception in all of the constructors. Because all of the constructors call the set size. And the set size the set size um, could throw an exception. So these have to catch the, either catch the exception or pass it on. OK. So now, OK, wow. Unreported, 
Guess what? It would have the same problem with sheet pizzas. Right? Because if I call <laughs> the constructor on the sheet pizza, I'm going to call the constructor on the super. The super could pass it back an exception. And therefore, this guy has to be in a position to handle exceptions. And again, none of these are going to handle the exception. They're just going to throw it to whoever called it. All right, I think this is finally the last of them. Super arg size, arg pepperoni, oh, there's one more constructor, jeez, <laughs> okay. Now. That wasn't horrible, right? It was kind of a pain in the butt to remember to do all those things, right? But what do you win by this, by going through that four minutes of pain, or however long it took me? You win the sense that if there's an error that, that, that calls, that is being triggered by your code, if there's some kind of unusual error condition, someone's going to handle it, all right? Which is exactly where you want to be. You don't want your program simply to crash. You want, to be able, you want your code to be robust to check for errors and to handle the errors. Notice again how I didn't remember way earlier in the class at some point I said the constructor on this guy, on the, on the pizza, instead of setting the size attribute itself, it's going to call the set size method. That way I only have this validation, I only have to have this validation method right in one place. So if we added a size, like extra large or whatever, I'd only have to make that change in one place. I wouldn't have to go everywhere where I called set size. All right? OK, so now it should run. And again, I get the message saying the message that was created from there. Questions on this? So what I want you to do for your assignment is I want you to go and look at all the situations that could exist in that last student one that you turned in. I think that's lab five. And identify the things that you'd want to catch for, things that you'd want to trap for. Then I want you to decide how you're going to handle the exception class-wise. Are you simply going to create an exception, or are you going to create your own exception class that maybe you can set some properties to? All right. So that's the first part of the, of the problem that's due Friday. The second part is to actually go and do that. So the first part is just going to be a Word document with a paragraph that says, I'm going to check for this, 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 and this. If I was doing this for the pizza, I would say I would check for um, the proper sizes. I would, set, uh, I would check for the proper, um, uh, what was the other one? Um, Crust, thicker, thick or thin? Yeah, yeah. yeah, crust, thick or thin. All right. So I would, uh, that's what I would say. I would test for those values, make sure those values were correct. All right. And maybe I would only throw exceptions, or maybe I would create a pizza exception class that would have certain attributes in it that I could, that I could set and then isolate those to use later. So that's what you're going to do in the first part, is just write up what exceptions you're going to catch and what object you're going to throw when those ex uh, uh, exceptions occur. And then again, the next part, you actually make it so. All right, I want to get started on GUIs today, and we won't get very far, but I want to show you how GUIs work quickly.
All right, this is a real simple example, only one class. All right, and it's a GUI class. You're typically going to make your GUI in, your, your GUI is going to sort of replace the unit test class. All right, it's going to be the class that has the main function on it, the main method. It's going to be the uh, class that creates your objects and goes and, and does that. For the most part, we're focusing on single screen programs in this class. All right. Um, you probably would always have an initial window that popped up, right? No matter what you did, all right? There would always be that first screen of your application that you go to invest, to, to initiate the action, all right? So that will be the one that has the main method in it, because that's what you're going to run from Java. Let's go and compile this, see what we get, and then start to take a look at it. Okay, notice what happens. We get a window that pops up. And we have enter temperature in set a grade and a convert button. So what is enter in zero centigrade? I click this, it's gonna tell me what it is in Fahrenheit. So it should be 32 degrees. All right, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. 100 centigrade should be 212. What if we put garbage in there? Invalid input. Nice. All right. So we're now catching and handling exceptions even. So we're doing the process and we're getting the data from the screen. We're doing something with it. We're displaying the results and we're displaying any error messages that we have. Yes. Um, we, we could talk about that. You would look at the length of it would be the number of characters to test. All right. So let's look at the code here. So I can close out of that. All right. Swing and AWT, don't ask me what AWT stands for, um, are two places where the um, GUI components live. Swing is where the, the classes for the different um, elements of the GUI live, like the um, text boxes, labels, buttons, that sort of thing. Action listeners and action event, all right, are the pieces of this, or the classes in the framework to handle the interactivity. In other words, when we ran this, yeah, it popped up a window, and there's a text box on it, but nothing happened until we typed something in and then hit the button. So that's an event. The user clicks a button. And there's some events you want to write code for. There's some events you don't care to write code for. I could click on that text box all day. I don't really want anything to happen. I could enter data in that text box all day. In this particular case, I don't want to have anything happen until I click the button. So the event is some action the user takes that you want to write some code to do something. The listener is the code that's going to wait and handle those events. It's listening, you know. Think of the button like a doorbell, right? When they click the doorbell, someone answers it. Who answers it? Well, the person that was listening for it. In this case, the class or the object that's listening for that event. 
doorbell, clip, doorbell press, whoever's listening for it, they're the one that's going to handle it. All right? So it could be a different person in, in, in every house that listens for the doorbell, right? Like back when, you know, my kids lived with me, I didn't listen for the doorbell because no one's ever coming to visit me. They were coming to visit my kids, right? So they were the doorbell listeners, right? They were the ones that were going to handle that. I guess someone that was really rich, they might have a butler that's a doorbell listener, and it's their job to do it. All you have to do to be a doorbell listener is fit certain criteria. You have to be able to answer the door, right? Well, if you notice here, my first GUI class extends JFrame. JFrame is like a container, a window. And it implements action listener. Implement, we've heard that word before. What does action listener mean? Therefore, if you're implementing action listener, what must action listener be? Pardon me? Not a method, an interface. Now, to be sure that action listener is going to contain a method, right? Because when we implement an interface, that means we're promising that certain methods are going to be there. In our case, the method that we're promising that, that's there is this. Action performed. So we have to have this action perform method in here because we said it implements the action listener. And the action performed method gets the event that actually happened, that there was a doorbell rang instead of someone knocking at the door or someone um, dialing the phone or whatever. And then we have our code to do something. This is the one thing that's, that's a little different. Um, those of you maybe have done ASP.NET, you define listeners for every action. For example, those of you in my ASP.NET class, there's a class that really more or less all the listeners live in. So if you have a button or two buttons or a button and a drop down or whatever, there's a, there's a file, there's a separate class that has all the code to handle these. In Java, it's a little bit different. You have to have a class that performs a listener, and the listener is for each thing that you have in your GUI that you want to program for. So we're going to have a separate class. If we had two buttons, we'd have two listeners. All right? Here, in a nutshell, is we're creating all of those elements on the screen. And then we're displaying them. And the action performed is the actual calculation that we're doing. All right? We'll pick up on this next time. Take a few minutes to, to read, read this program, to study it, and look to see if, if it makes sense or what part it seems confusing to you. The main thing I want to get from today is the idea of this GUI is the GUI but it also implements the listener, so it serves two roles. It's both the, the, the UI, the, 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 the class that contains all the UI elements, and it's also the class that contains the code that's going to process us clicking on the button or other things, potentially. All right, that's what we'll pick up on Wednesday. Uh, we'll see you in lab.